Hey there music fans, this is Peter Sko from Music is a Journey. Today I'd like to tell you about one of my favorite Japanese bands. They're a little bit unusual in my collection though, because this band is actually a pop slash rock band. But I really dig their music, so let me tell you about Garnet Crow. Garnet Crow was a pop rock band from Osaka, Japan that existed from 1999 to 2013. The band was comprised of Furui Hirohito, Arrangement, Nakamura Yuri, Composition and Vocals, Azuki Nana, Lyrics and Keyboards, and Okamoto Hitoshi, Guitars. The four musicians met at Giza Studio in the autumn of 1999 when they were assembled to work on an album by Japanese pop singer Kuraki Mai. Hitting it off really well, they talked about forming their own band. In the beginning, they didn't have a vocalist, but it was decided that Yuri would handle the vocals. The name Garnet Crow was chosen because it combined a semi-precious stone with a black bird that is often troublesome and a scavenger, an unpleasant image to contrast with the stone. Also, the members liked the phonetic sound of the name, and furthermore, there was a story of a crimson crow that is known to many Japanese. Garnet Crow released their debut mini-album, a six-track EP called First Kaleidoscope, Kimi no Ie ni Tsukuma de Zutto Hashite Yuku, on December 4th, 1999, on the indie label Tent House. The six tracks were recorded in just two months. This is where I first discovered Garnet Crow. I used to stop at a CD store at the train station near my workplace, and I would often check out the indie bands because I wasn't really into the popular Japanese pop music sound. In the indie bands, I could find things like punk, ska, heavy or melodic alternative, melodic metal, other types of music that were closer to my tastes. However, when I heard Garnet Crow, the thing that really intrigued me about them was their acoustic sound. There was a heavy emphasis on acoustic guitar and piano, and some songs even had violin or cello in them. I did not hear any other Japanese bands doing this style of music, and it really appealed to me. Later on, I found out that Garnet Crow were part of what was called the neo-acoustic scene in Japan at the time. Garnet Crow became signed to Giza Studio and spent the year of 2000 releasing singles. On March 29th, they simultaneously released Mysterious Eyes and a re-recorded and rearranged version of Kimi no Ie ni Tsukuma de Zutto Hashite Yuku, which was the first track on the EP. Both singles are noteworthy because Mysterious Eyes was the first of nearly a dozen songs of Garnet Crow's that would be used in the anime series Detective Conan and Kimi no Ie ni Tsukuma de Zutto Hashite Yuku is the only one of their 34 singles to never be used for television. Four more singles were released in 2000. Then, on January 31st, 2001, Garnet Crow released their debut full-length album, First Sound Scope, Mizu no Nai Hareta Umie. I picked up the Mysterious Eyes single, and I was a bit perplexed because Garnet Crow seemed to have suddenly morphed into a pop band. They had a programmed drum beat for the Mysterious Eyes single. However, it's true that they did have piano and electric guitar, along with a very catchy melody. So in the end, I actually liked that song. However, the B-side, Timing, seemed to really go for that cool, hip, pop groove type sound that was popular at the time, and uh, it didn't really appeal to me. 
So I kind of let the other five singles go, but I did pick up the debut album and I was intrigued. First of all, the opening track, Mizu no Nai Harate Umie, which is to the sunny waterless sea as a rough translation, it really begins quite mysteriously with this uh, pretty acoustic guitar, bringing in some piano and this kind of rolling keyboard effect. And then this pop beat comes in, but it keeps this smooth, kind of mysterious, dreamlike atmosphere almost. And in a way, I couldn't help but think the song could be similar to something Enya might do if she had that kind of programmed pop rhythm going to it. Other songs on the album also featured a lot of melodic harmonized vocals, especially in songs like Rhythm, where the final reiteration of the chorus, the, the harmonized vocals are really very beautiful. And a song like Wonderland showcases the band's soft pop side as well as the more catchy pop side, and then after the chorus goes into a kind of post-chorus part that is a little bit more rock with the guitar going, but still in that kind of mellowed out Garnet Crow style. Overall, I thought the album was actually pretty good, and even today it still remains in my top three or four Garnet Crow albums. During the year of 2001, Garnet Crow released three new singles and a fourth one in March of 2002. Up until this time, the band made no TV appearances and did not perform live as they wanted to concentrate on writing and recording. The singles all found their way onto the next album, Sparkle, Tsujikaki Dori no Sky Blue, released on April 24, 2002. But one thing that is already worth pointing out is that the B-sides of the singles were turning up some really good songs. Tracks like Jewel Fish from the Last Love Song single, Trance Trap from Call My Name single, and even White Out from Timeless Sleep and Kofuku na Petto from Yume Mita Atode were, in my opinion, just as strong as the singles and many of the album tracks. But because they didn't appear on any of the albums, I began to make it a point not to miss any new Garnet Crow releases. Sparkle featured 10 tracks and as well as bonus tracks, a remix of Mysterious Eyes and of Timeless Sleep. From the 10 tracks on the album, the three that stand out most for me are the almost dreamy, soft, mysterious, rock-like sound of Timeless Sleep. I also like the more groovy rock-based sound of Please Forgive Me. And then, of course, there is the almost religious-styled Prey, based mostly on piano and a very soft, slower piece. Now, it's interesting because I watched a Japanese YouTuber talking about the band, and he pointed out that Azuki Nana's lyrics often have a very strong spiritual or almost religious kind of meaning behind them. Now, of course, for a lot of the more upbeat pop songs, the more fun songs, or even some of the ballads, the lyrics are more about your usual falling in love and falling out of love, heartbreak type of thing. But she often also delves into much more deeper spiritual things, which show up in a lot of the lyrics of the songs. Sparkle became Garnet Crow's highest selling album, pushing over 156,000 units and landing a very respectable number four on the Oricon music chart, which is like the Japanese version of the Billboard chart. By now, Garnet Crow's popularity was growing thanks to their songs being played as the opening and closing themes of various anime and TV programs. The band finally began making TV appearances and doing live performances. Their 2002 tour was recorded in video and released in February of 2003, along with a documentary. Between August 2002 and September 2003, Garnet Crow released another four singles. Then, on November 12th, Crystallize, Kimi to Yu Hikari, the third album, was released. In my opinion, this album was a big step forward for the band. There were a lot of improvements, most notably in the sound, the mixing. On the previous albums and singles, I felt that the vocals and the digital programmed drum beats tend to be favored a little bit more in the mix with the electric instruments like electric guitar or organ or even synthesizer being left back in the mix a little bit. On Crystallize, I think everything was brought forward and comes off sounding as you feel it should, so that 
the rock guitar in some of the songs really do make the songs feel more like a rock song. As well, the acoustic guitar or the piano in other songs or the synthesizer, they are on par with the pop beats. But make no mistake about it, the band do not rely on digital or programmed beats throughout every song. There is also some percussion. Also, Yuri's vocals seem to have become stronger now. On some of the older recordings, some of the older songs, um, there were times when her voice, especially in the lower register, seemed it had a little trouble keeping the note steady. I feel she has overcome that by this album here, and she is given more of a chance to showcase her vocal abilities than before, most notably on the song uh, Kyo no Kimi to Ashito Matsu, where she does a beautiful little vocal solo near the end of the song, and then after the first verses at the beginning of Kimi to Yu Hikari, she also has this double-tracked vocal bit that sounds a little bit like an opera aria. Then one other point is that this album's I guess because of the improved mix or the improved production, the improved sound quality, the songs seem to differentiate from one another more so that the pop sounding songs really do sound more pop, but also the rock and the acoustic sounds also are more clearly that, but all in all still under the umbrella of that Garnet Crow sound. Looking over the tracks on this album, I'd say that Crystallize is also one of my top three or four picks for the Garnet Crow from the Garnet Crow catalog. One song that really stands out for me from this album is Marionette Fantasia, which is an acoustic-based song with a very pleasant vocal melody and what sounds like a flute solo in there as well. However, what really stands out for me is that it is done in 3-4 time. It is actually a waltz. 1-2-3-1-2-3. Anyway, it's really a nice touch to the album. So once again, Crystallize, certainly one of my top picks out of the Garnet Crow catalog. The single releases continued in 2004, but were becoming more ambitious. The previous 14 singles had contained only an A-side and a B-side with the occasional remixed song added on, and of course the instrumental version of the A-side for karaoke practice. But after Crystallize, it became very common to find two B-sides. Bokura Dake no Mirai contained Float World, which remains one of my most favorite Garnet Crow songs ever, and Lose Feeling. Kimi o Kazaru Hano Sakaso had Yasashi Yame and Yoake no Ryuseigun. And Wasurisaki, one of Garnet Crow's best ballads of all time, I think, came with Flower and Matsuri no Jikang, another track which I really like. Then, on December 8th, Garnet Crow released their fourth album. I'm Waiting for You, with four written as the numeral four to show that this was their fourth album featured the three new singles, eight new tracks, and as well a remixed version of Sky from the EP, which was remixed by Miguel Sapaseo, who had worked with the band on several songs in the past and would continue to work with them on a few more songs in the future. Of the new tracks, two of them really stood out for me. One of them, You, is a very interesting song that begins with a typical slow, mellow, Garnet Crow pop style, but suddenly key changes and gets into a more intense song. There's a feeling of, of tension in the music, and it goes through key changes a couple of more times throughout the song, which is really effective. And I often wonder what someone like Rick Beato would say if he analyzed the song, because he sometimes seems to notice things like, oh, there's an unexpected key change. <laughs> The other track I really like is Picture of World, which is a little bit more of a Garnet Crow rock style, and the chorus features that dun 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 kind of a power chord type riff almost. But of course, it's softened with organ and keyboard sound, so don't expect that Garnet Crow are suddenly going hard rock on us. This was the first Garnet Crow album to sell fewer than 80,000 copies, and in fact, it stopped just shy of 64,000. Also, it landed in spot number 11 on the Oricon charts, which was the first album not to crack the top 10. 2005 was a busy year for the band touring, but not so much in the studio. They released one single in May, Kimi no Omoi Kaita Yume Atsumaru Heaven, backed with two tracks. This single was not to be on the next album, and only showed up on two compilation albums some years later. On October 26th, they celebrated their fifth anniversary with the release of their first best-of compilation album, 
The track list featured all of their singles and some b-sides, as well as a new remix of Timeless Sleep, which was meant to be the definitive version. The four members of the band pressed onward in 2006, releasing another five singles leading up to their fifth album. The new singles showed the band writing confidently in their now-established sound scope. However, it seemed Garnet Crow were looking to expand their sound. The incredible Rai Rai Ya features mandolins and a kena, a traditional flute from the Andes. The song was used for a canon special TV program about mysteries of ancient times. Three other arrangements appeared on a special edition of the next single, Yume Hanabi, an all-vocal version called Mother Earth, a world music-styled instrumental version called Mysterious Mix, and an orchestral version. This special edition release included two regular B-sides and the usual non-vocal version of the single, for karaoke practice, for a total of seven tracks. The regular single release did not include the Mother Earth or orchestral versions of Rai Raya, but did include the TV program version of the song. The Twilight Valley was released on October 4th, 2006. This is one of my favorite Garnet Crow albums. It opens with the incredible Anywhere with a very soft and almost mysterious piano. It has very catchy vocals. It has real drums in there. It is an incredible piece that almost sounds to me as if a progressive rock band tried to write a shorter four-minute song that could possibly be played on the radio. Other tracks include Rusty Rail with a really beautiful acoustic guitar riff and again wonderful melodies. Then there is also Weekend, which was a bit of a slow grower for me, but I eventually picked up on it and I, I particularly like the piano and stand-up bass as well. Then there is the kind of soft rock track Marginal Man. Now one thing that I noticed going over this album again is that of the songs I like best of Garnet Crows, most of them, or the majority of them anyway, actually do have real drums. It doesn't mean that they don't use any kind of programming for percussion, but it seems that they, they use real drums more so in the songs that stand out more for me. And I think the ones that rely really solely on programming for the rhythm section are the ones that I am most likely to not be interested in. So this album, I feel here, they really tried to focus more on the organic instruments and less on the programming. As I said, this is one of my top picks for Garnet Crow albums. In fact, for any newcomer to the band who wanted to pick up an original album, this might be the one that I would recommend checking out. Sadly, the album only sold around 58,000 copies and was the third consecutive album to sell fewer copies than the previous one. However, it did manage to land a respectable number four position on the Oricon charts, tying with Sparkle for the highest position on the charts of a Garnet Crow album. Garnet Crow once again completed three more singles. Two songs were released simultaneously as two different singles, but basically two versions of the same release, with one as the A-side and the other as the B-side. The single release of Konoteo no Baseba included Kazeto Rainbow and Mawari Michi plus a TV edit version of the A-side. And the Kazeto Rainbow version included Konoteo no Baseba as the B-side along with Mawari Michi and a TV edit of the A-side. There were two other singles released, as usual, with two B-sides. It's interesting to note that with all the B-sides Garnet Crow was releasing with their singles, they were actually releasing enough material to compose a fourth album for every three regular albums they released. The new album, Locks, was released on March 12, 2008, and it was only the second time the band released an album in the spring. Most of their albums were released in the fall or winter at the end of the year. Locks was released in three different versions. The A version, which included a DVD with a live performance, the B version, which included a DVD with three music videos, and then the regular version, which was just a CD. The album included the four singles, plus three songs that I really think are worth mentioning. The opening track, Saigo no Rito, The Last Isolated Island, is a really powerful number opening with acoustic guitar and piano and launching straight into the chorus, 
Later on, there's a symphony or an orchestra backing the band, and I think the chorus is especially powerful. It's a beautiful, rousing, Garnet Crow acoustic number. Then there is Futari, which is the rock song on the album, and we do get a really nice bit of uh, distorted guitar riff work in one part of the song by Okamoto Hitoshi. Then there's Mr. Holiday, which is a light, fun pop song, which uh, the two ladies there, Yuri and Nana, made up a little dance to do during the performance, which they talked about during an episode of Garnet Time, which was a short late night TV program they had on television locally in Osaka. You can catch videos of this on YouTube if you're interested. In spite of having three different versions of the album, Locks only sold around 45,000 copies. However, it still managed to land position number five on the Oricon charts. Before the tour for Locks even began, Garnet Crow released yet another single, Yume no Hitotsu, and a video. Three more single releases brought the band's total single output up to 30. Then on September 30th, 2009, they released their seventh album, Stay, Yoake no Soul. From this album, my picks are the jaunty power pop song, Fall in Life, Hallelujah, and also the very beautiful acoustic ballad, Rainy Soul. One of the top ballads by the band, I think. Also, there was the single, Hyakunen no Kodoku, 100 Years of Loneliness, which is a typical, uh, more serious styled Garnet Crow ballad, but it has very powerful introduction, very very beautiful introduction with some really nice piano added in for a very dramatic, slow but dramatic type of effect. I really enjoy that. Then one more song worth mentioning was the single Doing All Right, which is an upbeat kind of party pop rock song, but in the chorus features the We Will Rock You rhythm, the Doing All Right, like that. <laughs> Unfortunately, Stay only sold around 31,000 copies, but still managed to land number seven on the charts. The sales were a far cry from the 156,000 copies or so of Sparkle a few years earlier, and one has to wonder if the band continued to be landing somewhere around in the middle of the top 10, why were their sales continuously decreasing? Something must have been happening in the Japanese music market. Why otherwise could they continue to hold a very respectable position in the charts, but sell fewer and fewer albums with each new release? In February of 2010, Garnet Crow commemorated their 10th anniversary by releasing their second compilation album, The Best History of Garnet Crow at the Crest. For this release, the masters were sent to New York and remastered by Ted Jensen, who mastered The Eagles' Hotel California and Green Day's American Idiot, as well as the 20th anniversary remaster of Clayman by In Flames. The release came in two versions, a double disc of singles and a triple disc edition with a selection of album tracks and b-sides on the third disc. The 31st single, Overdrive, was released in April, and then in August, another compilation album called All Lovers was released. This was a concept compilation album, of album tracks and b-sides that the band really wanted to share with fans. This is an excellent companion album to the Best Of album released in February, and of all the 16 tracks on All Lovers, only one appears on another compilation album. On December 8th, their 8th album Parallel Universe was released. It's my opinion that Parallel Universe is where Garnet Crow's sound really hit its peak. The quality of the mixing and the production is spectacular. The sound of Yuri's voice, they seem to rely less on these kind of um, layered vocal tracks and give her more room to simply just sing out loud and strong and use the full range of her voice without relying on these multi-tracked techniques they used previously, which actually I did really like. Couple of the tracks that really stand out, The Crack Up, a, again, one of those Garnet Crow ballads with just a really powerful chorus. And then there is the track Kyoto Ashtato, which is one of Garnet Crow's typical acoustic numbers. This one actually featuring an accordion. 
Perhaps it was due to the lack of singles promoting the album, or perhaps it was because of all the other releases during the year, but Parallel Universe only managed to sell somewhere around 23,000 copies, and actually landed 10th place on the Oregon charts. The Best of album did manage to sell 36,000 copies, but All Lovers only sold 12,404. There was also a DVD release that year, Garnet Crow Livescope 2010, The Best, a double DVD which reached number 5 in DVD sales in Japan and number 2 in music DVD sales. The band pushed on in 2011 with two more singles, Smiley Nation and Misty Mystery, before dropping their ninth album, Memories, on December 7, 2011. Though I dismissed this album early on as being too poppy, I have since found that there is another great diversity in the music. Ishoni Kuraso is a very smooth 70s sounding uh, groovy rocker almost. Smiley Nation is a very upbeat power pop pop type song. And then there is Eiyu, which means hero, which is a very beautiful, epic type of ballad which tells the story of a soldier who wished he could have remained in his hometown and shared his love with someone, but instead went out to fight in the war and his heart remains unfulfilled. He achieves the title of hero for all his work, but he wishes the river would just take that title away and just let him be a man. There were other great tracks on the album as well. Another one that stood out is the song Judy. The initial release of the CD also came with a DVD. Sadly, the album only reached 11th place in the charts and didn't quite manage 20,000 units in sales. This was the second time a Garnet Crow album failed to hit the top 10. Garnet Crow released a double album of B-sides in February 2012. This included 32 B-sides and an English version of Judy. From 2011 to 2012, the band also released three more DVDs, and a single, Nostalgia, was released in September of 2012. Perhaps the band had become discouraged by their album sales or the market, perhaps there were personal reasons, but when the band released their 10th album, Terminus, on March 20th, 2013, it seemed the end had arrived. If the title alone wasn't to give away, the cover with the band all dressed in black certainly would have suggested it. At their concert a few days later, they announced the band was breaking up. Two more compilation releases came out that year, a triple disc of all their 34 singles and a special request best double disc of specifically selected tracks including singles, b-sides, album tracks, and one previously unreleased track, Butterfly Knot. Terminus managed to reach position number 9, but only sold around 17,000 copies. Still, the album was certainly worthy of the Garnet Crow name. There were a number of terrific tracks on there. Some of them that really stand out for me are the song Maisie, which has an incredible chorus, yet another one of those Garnet Crow ballads with a really powerful chorus and Yuri really showing off her vocal abilities. Then there was also probably their best power pop rocker ever, Life Goes On, love that song. And there were some other really beautiful, more acoustic based ones like Umi o Yuku Shishi, which they made a video for, and Kagami ni Mita Yume. As well, the single track Nostalgia is also a pretty cool rocker with some nice heavy organ. Uh, pop rocker, let's say, anyway. <laughs> The Request Best Compilation album, I think, has an excellent selection of songs, and it's another one that I would recommend to a first-time or casual Garnet Crow listener. Sadly, that album only reached about 8,000 copies in sales. Though, to be fair, a good number of the tracks had previously been on other compilation releases. The Best of Album of 2010, the All Lovers album, or the B-Sides collection. One final compilation album was released in December of 2014, basically 15 years after the release of their debut EP. It was a collection of ballads, however, of the 16 tracks, 15 of them had already been featured on recent compilation releases, meaning there wasn't anything really to entice the buyer to pick up something new. The album landed in spot number 55 on the Oricon charts, which was a new record low for a Garnet Crow release. 
the previous record being held by their third single, Futari no Roketo, which landed at 47. Since then, the band released a premium box set of 24 CDs and 8 DVDs, a Blu-ray box set, and in 2021, a DVD of their Terminus tour of 2013. In 2020, they celebrated their 20th anniversary with some t-shirts and other events, but there was no band reunion and no new material released. Garnet Crow seems truly to have wrapped things up in 2013. What killed the band? Why did their albums sell less and less with each consecutive release? Well, one of the interesting things I saw one YouTuber point out was Garnet Crow's career spanned a period of several developments. First of all, the rise of the internet, and then things such as YouTube, social networking, downloading music, iTunes, and so on. And it seems to me that when I did some research several years ago on the release of progressive rock and progressive metal bands in the latter half of the 2000s, a lot of bands had a release gap lasting five years to several years where there were no albums released during that period. As well, during that time, one of the members of Deep Purple said that they couldn't recover the costs of recording an album because sales of albums were so poor. And even Alex Lifeson of Rush was thinking that maybe they should just go on releasing singles and not bother with a new album. It seems to me that downloading albums for free really did a number on the actual album sales. I guess people's desire to get music without paying actually ended up causing the end of one of Japan's most interesting pop rock bands. And who knows how many other bands and artists suffered a similar fate. You could say that interest in Garnet Crow's music was waning, but then if their albums continuously landed in the top 10, but sales were getting fewer and fewer, you have to imagine that other Japanese bands also in the top 10, other Japanese artists landing in the top 10 must have also been seeing fewer and fewer album sales. In a way, I like that there are 10 studio albums and a stack of singles, plus some very nice selected compilation albums. I feel like there was something very special that happened in the Japanese pop scene that lasted for just a little over a decade and then disappeared forever, which somehow makes it a little bit more precious than if the band were continuously churning out new albums year after year, like many other artists do. I consider myself very lucky to happen to have stumbled upon Garnet Crow, and even though I go through stretches of several years of not listening to their music, and even questioning, do I really have an interest in the band? Every time I listen to them, I'm reminded that I do really actually enjoy their music. And in fact, these last few weeks, I've been listening to nothing but Garnet Crow. They really have my attention right now. I missed out on the 20th anniversary t-shirts. However, if they have a 25th anniversary t-shirt event, I'll try to grab one at that time. What are the four members of the band doing now? Well, I read that Azuki Nana is actually, has actually been doing some acting as well. She's still writing song lyrics and still involved in music a little bit. As for the other members, I don't really know. Most information or practically all information that's available on the internet is in Japanese. So it does take me time to read or listen. And I just haven't really put the effort in to find out what everyone else is doing. But I sure hope that they are still active in music somehow because they all have really good, respectable, appreciable talent. So for now, I have given you the basic release history of one of Japan's most interesting pop rock acts to come out in the last 20 years, at least in my opinion. If you're curious, you can find a lot of their videos and music available on YouTube as well. A friend of mine said she found them on Spotify. So if you're curious, do try to check them out. That's all for today's video then. I thank you for watching and yeah, I hope you're kind of interested in the band a little bit. Next time, Probably I'll have to get back to something a little bit heavier. Catch you then. Bye, everyone.